Okay, let's begin. So this is the EUSPR major session. So it's still time to leave. We're going to talk about prevention. I am Gregor Burkhardt. I'm the president of the EUSPR, and I'm also a staff member of EUDA. You know, probably you don't know, that EUDA at the time, EMCDA, had a substantial role in the foundation of the European Society of Prevention Research 15 years ago. We had just our birthday supported our first conferences and is still helping out when needed. The point, everyone talks a lot about community-based prevention. Less is known about actually how it works, why it works, does it work at all, and what is its additional value. You know, Lately, many people are saying prevention is developmental, meaning focusing on people becoming more resilient, competent, self-competent, self-controlled, and so on, leaving apart that most of our behavior de depends on our environment. So the whole thing of environmental components in prevention can, at best, or be done within community-based prevention, a little bit in school-based prevention. The point is just how, what are the mechanisms, what is the evidence? And you might have heard about the row that was that um, the CEO of Planet Use from Iceland made a complaint, the chairperson of the management board of EUDA, that we have kind of a conflict of interest because we gave a very reserved statement of, about the effectiveness of the Icelandic model on our websites. And so just yesterday, a very special, uh, an exceptional committee of the exchange rating board issued the final report saying, no, the ratings are accurate. We have actually no evidence that, or doubts about the effectiveness of the Icelandic model. But this is not about this. It is just showing you how much the question of community-based prevention, its effectiveness and its working mechanisms have become a theme of even political inferences, if someone writes to the, press, to the chairperson of a management board. So it has become important. The evidence ratings of exchange registry of EUDA are important. And here we have a panel of people who have large experiences in community-based prevention recent experiences, to see what are the challenges, what can be done. We begin with Samuel, board member of the EOSPR, professor at the University of Greifswald, who will give us the first framing of the issue. Wonderful. Thank you very much for the introduction, Gregor, and for stressing the importance of the topic. Thanking, thank you you, to all of you for attending the session, for having such great interest in the topic. I try to give sort of a brief introduction or overview of community-based prevention and also community-based participatory research in prevention to sort of um, see where we are at this point, what we know, what we don't know, and lay sort of the groundwork for the following presentations. We will have more applied examples, case studies, if you will, following that, and we will also have more a policy systems perspective to round things out. So just give you a brief idea of what the session will, will be about. And this is more the heavily relying on science and more the conceptualization of sorts to give an introduction here. First of all, for the conflicts of interest, I do not have any conflicts of interest to report because I am not developing or implementing, evaluating any types of community-based interventions that I present here. Myself, I'm doing sort of the meta research, so looking at reviews, at effectiveness, and things like that of these interventions. So I'm not that aligned to these types of um, conflicts. The first step here, if we look at community-based prevention and we frame it more as community-based participatory research in prevention or in prevention science, which could be a good angle to go about because it's much easier to grasp, I guess, than to just say something is community-based. If we say it's participatory research, then we have a framework for it. So a key question here is, is it hype or is it hope? So is it just something that's modern, that people do nowadays, participation is everywhere, or is it really something that we can look forward to, that we can build on? So the main agenda is just to give you a brief introduction into the terminology or the idea what community-based participatory research, community-based prevention, public health can be, what it cannot be, 
why we need it, why it is important, how it works, or what the idea is of how it works. We will then see if it actually is the case in the next presentations and what some of the challenges are. Again, this is sort of an overview and introduction, so it's not the be-all, end-all of presentations. It would not contain all the knowledge. There are many different researches, many different concepts, models out there. This is important to me to stress that. So if you have any additions or things you would like to discuss or any differing opinions, it's very welcome, and you can also contact us at any point. Just keep in mind that we have a brief session and we have a brief presentation. So the general idea behind the community-based approach is that it is a combination of different stakeholders, different groups, which contain community stakeholders. So this can be people in schools, children, adolescent families, but also policy makers or practitioners from the prevention field, for example. So all community members that have a stake in the topic at hand. And it's also connected across different conditions. It can be about chronic conditions, it can be about health disparities or diseases, and it is usually along the entire research cycle. So in the prevention science field, this means from the needs assessment through the development, the implementation of interventions, and the evaluation of said interventions. The key terms here that I would like to stress, which is very neatly presented by the NIH as well in their framework on community-based participatory health research is that it's interdisciplinary and intersectoral work, so it really connects different areas together. It's transdisciplinary because it needs to happen within communities and their rules and systems, and it also is strongly connected to the idea of empowerment, specifically for disenfranchised parts of the population, so people that do not have a voice or are not heard of as much need to be also part of the process and come to the table here. And they also have a framework where they list different levels of influence here. Uh, for settings, we have the individual levels where a lot of action is happening, for example, regarding treatment efforts and psychotherapeutic treatment, for example, for specific diseases or uh, mental disorders. But we also have interpersonal social aspects and then the community level. And what I wanted to take away from this framework here is just to keep in mind that when we talk about communities, we talk about community-based processes as well. So there's a difference between individual level or social level processes, discussions, mechanisms, and community level discussions, mechanisms, and processes. So this is something that's interesting for us from the research perspective, but also very challenging if we think about action research. So we really need to define our aims, our approaches, and think about what we actually know or don't know regarding the evidence. A very brief overview of the history. Apologies for leaving other important traditions out of here. These are just some of the key influences that I am aware of that are cited a lot in the literature. Uh, there's social psychological work from Kurt Levine on democratic participation in the workplace, which already started around the 1930s. We have Laura Thompson, who works more from the anthropology perspective and government participation. So it's also connected a lot to democratic processes, to political processes, not only to health. And then we also have Paulo Freire and others who worked on the specifically in the so-called Global South on uh, giving a voice to people that previously had not a voice before in democratic processes again. So people who were oppressed, who were marginalized in the 1970s. And a strong focus on health and participatory action in health was then reintroduced also in seminal work in the 1990s and also in the earlier 2000s, for example, by Israel and colleagues or Wallerstein and colleagues who have developed participatory health models. And they can look something like this. I don't want to go into detail throughout this model, but the general idea here is that we can define not only an intervention, as we do in some cases, and we outline mechanisms for this specific intervention, but we start much earlier by looking at the context in which interventions are happening. What are we talking about? What settings? What populations? What kind of differences? Socioeconomic, socio-demographic? What do people bring to the table? And which are the groups that we need to integrate when we want to work with them? Which are the stakeholders here? Specific communities, community-based organizations or CBOs, uh, universities, for example, or other research institutions, agencies that are funding trials or interventions, and then we also have the specific things that we implement and, of course, the outcomes we focus on. And again, we have outcomes on individual levels, something like an individual quality of life assessment could be a part here, or a reduction of specific symptoms or problem behaviors. We can also look at social outcomes, for example, social cohesion or social capital in a certain region, and we can also look more at system-related outcomes. So, for example, the functioning of a neighborhood or the perceived support there or the perceived safety of neighborhoods and things like that. So we have outcomes on different levels. And people who are highly ingrained in this type of work also make a case for it. This is one example by Wallerstein and Duren who have 
presented a very nice table, which is why I just copied their table here to give credit to their work at this point, where they say, okay, if you look at traditional translational research that aims to really bring research, university or higher education research or clinical research into the practice, into daily life, into the applied fields, then we have a lot of challenges, right? We have external validity. We don't know if it works under these conditions in everyday settings. We don't know if everything is understood correctly, if people use the same terms, if they have the same perception of things. So we say that the academic knowledge is sort of a better knowledge than indigenous knowledge oftentimes because we say they use scientific methods, they know how things work, they know how it goes, they have a certain rigor to the studies that they are doing. And the participatory research has more of an equal playing field here. They try to bring these traditions together and to combine the indigenous knowledge, the things that are already there, that people are working with every day with the academic perspective, the academic and scientific lens. This also pertains to the language that we use, the terms that we use, how we discuss the work that we are doing. Uh, we think about how universities themselves and research institutions can be part of local communities, so how can they work better together with institutions that are around there, and also how can we build trust from there. And again, if we use community-based participatory approaches, we have a way forward. So Duke makes a very proud statement about that. It's almost more of a mission statement, if you will, where he says that community-based participatory research may con be considered not only a methodological and epistemological approach to understanding the issues facing community members, so not just another research method to focus on communities, but also a social movement to democratize knowledge production on a global scale. So the general idea here is to say that we can be proud if we do this type of work and it's a very important one because it can change social movements, it can say, change social processes, it has a political component, it gives a voice to people in everyday life and it really combines stakeholders from the communities with stakeholders in agencies, stakeholders that are experts in the field, stakeholders in research and gives everyone a perspective. So, I think it's hard to oppose that statement and to say that's something that we don't want or that we don't agree with. Most of us probably will. But the question here is, what does it bring us? What is the merit? Does it actually work? And this is sort of the second question that I aim to go towards here. So the question is, if we apply these methods in prevention science, what does the evidence actually tell us? And from our perspective, we have done um, a so-called umbrella review using the Joanna Briggs Institute's methodology, which is where we look at previously published work, mostly systematic reviews, meta-analysis that have looked at what is out there, so the research interventions that have been done and things like that, and we try to combine them and to see if we look at all of them together, what do we find here? What are the common points that are questions? What are the common strengths that we find here? What is uh, basically the main outcome? And we have identified over 120, roughly 120 relevant reviews meta-analysis, which is a lot. And they look at many primary studies that focus on community-based action and prevention. And the first good thing is we have a very diverse set of topics. So we have youth groups, homeless, drug users, seniors, or families. We have looked at the quality of studies. The quality of reviews were mixed. Some of them were very good. Some of them were not as good. And regarding the content, many qualitative studies look more in processes and sometimes outcomes. Uh, and the quantitative studies were largely measuring individual level effects. So the first idea here was that uh, the full potential was not realized of community-based work because the assessment did not actually measure effects on all different levels. It was either individual level effects or community level outcomes or speculations, but rarely did we find a combination of really different effects on different levels in social settings, in families, in schools, together with individual self-reports, for instance. Moreover, we found that many researchers targeted cardiovascular risk factors or behavioral risk factors, which is in line with prevention science as well. So alcohol use, smoking, nutrition and obesity, and more recently also quite a large body of research on mental health. The strongest effects so far were obtained for physical activity and also other health and risk behaviors, less for specific health-related behaviors, so other types of behaviors, for example, help-seeking in certain contexts, or vaccination behaviors, or whatever you want to uh, put under the umbrella of health behaviors in that way. So there is still some research that needs to be done or to summarize these types of efforts, because they are there, but they are not as systematically reviewed yet. 
And also the social determinants of health, for example, with the progress taxonomy have not been looked into detail as much. And again, young people as a very important target group, we hear that many times for preventive efforts, for early intervention and things like that, were also a big part of the research, but also seniors were often targeted, for example, in fall prevention or working with loneliness and mental health topics. We also found stronger effects for community-based programs and interventions that combined individual level interventions, so behavioral interventions or group-based with environmental prevention, as Gregor has mentioned. So for example, public spaces that can foster physical activity. We also found uh, that true participatory and co-creative research that integrated community members from the beginning as part of the research teams and co-researchers seem to have stronger effects, long-standing effects, and also spillover. So for example, on social capital or social cohesion, and also the community engagement or the community empowerment could lead to increased process outcomes. So for example, self-efficacy and trust. However, and this is the important point that leads to the next conclusion or discussion point here, the connection to actual health outcomes was not as strong in many studies. We found many intermediate outcomes like self-efficacy, social cohesion, connectedness, friendship, and collaborative actions, but not as many clear connections to health outcomes. What could be um, and the implication here? One process, the process to approach this is the idea to look at um, intermediate personnel. For example, a quite recent review by Tinner and colleagues has looked at community mobilization interventions, which means trainings for stakeholders, for example, for prevention professionals or decision makers to implement more evidence-based prevention programs. So work with community coalitions, basically, to then figure out what the problems are or the issues are or what the strengths are and how we can use them for preventive purposes and what evidence-based strategies, programs, interventions are out there that we can use to this end. This is the general idea of these community mobilization interventions and they reviewed many different that they identified here. And what they tried to do is not, again, unfortunately, look as much on the effectiveness of these interventions, so the clear outcomes and the connections there, but rather the mechanisms, so to describe and categorize how these interventions might work. So they looked at how these interventions implemented guiding principles in all fractions of life, so across different contexts, schools, families, and so on. They looked at uh, the local um, analysis of local data for risk behaviors and protective factors or the acceptance of interventions. They looked at long-term funding, long funding to support the programs. Um, as said, again, the use of population data, but also to make decisions and to track the progress, so monitoring and evaluation and to build coalitions with a mix of expertise, for example, research and community members, and finally, intervention champions. So people within communities that can be strong um, people to go to for these interventions, for future implementations. And to just quickly give you an, an overview here, they identified a few of these community mobilization interventions. For example, the Icelandic prevention model was in there, the communities that care model was in there which were applied in Iceland and in certain settings in the USA, but then also in other countries. And there were a few other, for example, Prosper, New Directions, Project Freedom. I put all of them here on the slide for you to see. And it's just an overview to see how many of these mechanisms were actually reported or were actually triggered in, uh, in these uh, programs. And just to, and briefly, we can see that only few interventions achieved all of these mechanisms. Still, we don't know if they actually lead to the outcomes. That's not the main focus of this analysis, so that's not what the authors reported here. But we see that these mechanisms are being activated. So the idea is that we can actually improve community-based um, processes through these actions, but not under all conditions, not in all countries, not with all approaches. There are many differences here. So these are also the takeaways. Uh, most of these approaches have been implemented in single communities or in single settings, so it's very specific. It's not sure whether these can be translated to other countries, other cultures as well. For example, the accident prevention model, where this is an ongoing discussion, or the uh, communities that care approach. Also, many of the highly rated interventions are rather old, so from the um, early 2000s, for example, follow-up data is not always available, especially for evaluation trials. For example, there was a long-term outcome study of the communities that care approach, but this is not the case for all types of interventions. And the mechanisms, as I said before, can be identified, but the outcomes are not always clear and the designs do not always allow, allow for causal inference. So to just keep it brief here, this is, I guess, uh, the main message. Uh, 
Uh, there are some challenges, but I guess um, this can also be a point for discussion for later on. So the main takeaway message from my perspective is that there is a lot of potential in community-based participatory research. It, it's really worth taking a look at it and thinking about integrating it into our work more strongly. But there are also a lot of challenges. There's a lot that we don't know about the translation, about the effectiveness, about actually measuring the mechanisms and not only describing them. So uh, hopefully we'll give you some ideas here today at this session and a few points to discuss how we can move forward in the field and in which areas we can more strongly point to these effects. Thank you very much for your attention. You are second, right? Okay, now. Thank you, Samuel, for keeping tightly in time. We have slightly 16, 17 minutes per speaker. Now we have Max, Maximilian von Heiden, Finder Academy in Berlin. A uh, future USPR board member. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Gregor. Um, welcome, everyone. Today I'm, today, I'm very excited to share insights about Communities That Care, a prevention system that has demonstrated remarkable success in building sustainable prevention capacity in communities, not only in the US, but worldwide. Um, before I dive into the presentation, it's important both to acknowledge first the researchers who developed and validated Communities That Care, with whom I'm not affiliated. It was developed by David Hawkins and Richard Catalano at the Social Development Research Group at the University of Washington. And um, I must admit that their rigorous approach to development and evaluation has given us one of the most well-documented prevention systems available uh, that has inspired many other initiatives. And in the interest of transparency, of course, besides my role as a researcher at Charité, Berlin's university hospital, I'm co-founder of a nonprofit organization that is advocating for CTC implementation in Germany, um, not because we have a financial interest or other direct um, affiliations with this research group, but uh, our selection was based on a comprehensive review of available evidence for prevention systems at the community level, and CTC is the only available model in Germany at the moment. So, why focus on CTC today? At this Lisbon edition, uh, 2024 edition, we are focused on empowering the workforce of tomorrow, and we face three critical challenges. First, building sustainable prevention capacity. Second, ensuring evidence-based implementation. And third, supporting workforce development across diverse contexts. As you see here, there's many issues and challenges to be addressed. And CTC specifically addresses these challenges through a structured evidence-based approach, which I will show you in the following slides. So I want to start with some guiding key questions um, that help us understand how CTC addresses these workforce challenges and uh, we'll explore them throughout this presentation. So first, what makes it unique in the landscape of prevention science? How does it translate prevention theory into community practice? What evidence supports its effectiveness and how robust is this evidence? How does CTC impact community prevention systems beyond individual outcomes? And what are the implications for the broader field of addiction prevention? <clears throat> so what is communities that care? Uh, as I said, it has been developed by David Hawkins and Richard Catalano at the University of Washington Social Development Research Group in the 1990s, when I was born. <laughs> and, and it functions kind of like, I, I would like to use a metaphor, like an operating system for prevention. Just like a computer's operating system coordinates various programs and processes, CTC coordinates prevention efforts uh, in a community. It provides them with a structured process to build capacity for prevention, to use data to guide decisions, and to help them select and implement tested programs in a participatory process. And about participation, we just learned uh, that it's an important aspect of community mobilization. And it also helps monitoring outcomes and adjust uh, them as needed. So on what theoretical foundation is CTC building? It is firmly grounded in the so-called social development model, also developed by Catalano and Hawkins. 
it's an integrative theory combining elements from control theory, social learning theory, and differential association theory to explain pro-social and problem behaviors. Sadly, I don't have enough time to dive into that uh, theory, which is very intriguing and has a very solid evidence base, but just for time reasons, I will focus on its application, the so-called social development strategy, which you can see uh, on the right-hand side. The theoretical foundation guides uh, CTC's approach to prevention, and it ensures that interventions target only empirically supported pathways to behavior change. It outlines the specific temporal sequence for implementation uh, and for expected effects. So um, community prevention is a long time effort or long term effort. So CTC expects changes in risk and protective factors to become visible within two to five years, improvements in youth behavioral outcomes within four to seven years after installation of the system and sustained community level changes in prevention system functioning. So understanding this timeline is crucial for communities implementing CTC as it helps to set realistic expectations. It is obviously not a quick fix <laughs> to problems which may be prevalent in a community, but it provides benchmarks for monitoring progress and the predictable nature of the expected effects allows communities to plan appropriate evaluation schedules to maintain stakeholder engagement throughout the process to identify when adjustments may be needed and to build sustainable long-term prevention systems. So let's have a look at how it is actually working. So what are the key components of CTC and how is it structured? CTC follows a five-phase process that aligns with the public health action cycle, which most people in this room probably know, along planning, implementation, and evaluation. So phase one, here on the right-hand side, is about assessing community readiness, securing key leader commitment, identifying champions for prevention, establish initial structural conditions, and it's pretty much focusing on building the foundation for a successful implementation of the system. In phase two, getting organized, it's about forming or adapting an intersectoral coalition that that will be provided training in prevention science principles and prepare for data collection, which is a very crucial step. A key milestone is establishing a rep representative community board as part of a participatory process that includes diverse uh, stakeholders from multiple sectors. In phase three, communities analyze local data, and we will have a look at what kind of data they um, assess, um, to learn about risk and protective factors. They also assess existing prevention activities in the community and prioritize specific factors to address based on community needs. And this evidence-based assessment guides the strategic planning of the process. In phase four, it's about creating an action plan. So the coalition, which has formed in phase three, develops measurable objectives, selects evidence-based programs, from validated registries and creates detailed implementation plans. And building a broad community support for the action plan, of course, is essential because otherwise it just remains at being something people would like to see. <laughs> and in phase five, it's about implementing, monitoring, evaluating, and it's obviously a cycle. So it's typically expected to be repeated each two to three years. So there's a continuous adjustment of the strategy. How does this data-driven decision-making work? So um, the CTC uh, group has developed a youth survey, which is also available in, in several languages, which assesses risk and protective factors and has been rigorously validated and shows strong uh, to good psychometric properties across diverse populations. And this reliable data, which gives young people a voice in the community and can be considered also a means of participation, essentially, um, guides communities in prioritizing risk factors or protective factors that, um, that score unexpectedly high or low, and helps them selecting programs that specifically address these factors, and also helps them monitoring progress by repeating this survey from time to time. So giving each student a voice allows their perspective to shape the understanding of community needs, because typically, 
in Germany, we would say, there's a kind of middle class orientation in what we do in prevention and health promotion because there's a lack of understanding of what the most vulnerable population actually want and need. <clears throat> so how does selection of tested and effective programs work or choosing what works, that's the process. Sadly, we know that not all prevention and health promotion programs are effected, effective or suited for the specific needs of a population. So how do we ensure communities select the most appropriate and effective and also cost-effective interventions? CTC's approach is quite interesting. A key aspect of it is its emphasis on implementing tested measures and communities typically select from a menu of evidence-based interventions, not only programs um, like those listed in blueprints or exchange registry from EUDA. I've just put um, another one on the screenshot. That's the so-called green list prevention from Germany, uh, where you can actually take the identified and prioritized risk and protective factors from the youth survey, put it into the search engine, and you will be proposed different programs that specifically address these factors and also uh, sorted by the d level of evidence um, uh, that is available for these programs. Importantly, it's not only about choosing them, but of course also about sometimes adapting and implementing them in the local context. And here the challenge is to maintain core components as part of this implementation process, which we, yeah, would say is a key challenge in implementation science, namely balancing fidelity with local relevance, uh, which, which I kind of try to put into this picture here on the right, yeah, where you see it's a, it's a decent proper house, but it has somehow been implemented in a strange way. And uh, so the approach to implementation aligns closely with current best practices in implementation science to avoid this specific visual outcome here. Uh, through providing comprehensive training, technical assistance, and fidelity monitoring tools to ensure high-quality delivery of the selected programs, which may not necessarily only, for example, be implemented uh, on the school level, but they may address uh, parents, uh, they may address, address all kinds of services within a community um, and go far beyond the typical settings which we have in mind when we discuss prevention. So. Um, Looking at the research, it has shown that communities implementing CTC typically have higher adoption rates and implementation fidelity of evidence-based programs compared to control communities. We will have a look at the evaluation on the next slide with more detail. So the emphasis on implementation quality is really crucial for bridging the gap between prevention science and community practice. So. What do we know from the research? What level of evidence do we need to confidently say a community level intervention like CTC works? The Community Youth Development Study sets, from my perspective, a very high bar for evaluation rigor. But what exactly did this study reveal about CTC's impact? Well, you can already read. <laughs> so <laughs> the CYDS followed more than 4,000 participants across 24 communities in the US as part of a cluster randomized controlled trial. And it's a longitudinal study, so there's follow-up publications still being published. And after 12 years, there were still statistically significant global effects observed across both primary and secondary outcomes. And most notably, CTC communities showed significantly higher lifetime abstinence from alcohol and illicit drugs, the interventions, and, and also antisocial behavior. The intervention demonstrated strong economic returns. Um, as you can see here, a return on investment of uh, $12 per $1 invested, which is a very strong argument also for decision makers, given that it's a long-term investment. Importantly, all analysis controlled for individual and community level covariates and used intent to treat analysis to handle missing data, strengthening the validity of these findings. A crucial aspect of these findings is the timing, and that's, that's very important about this specific study. CTC was only implemented during grades six to nine, so middle school to early secondary school. Um, yet effects persisted through age 23. This means the intervention created lasting behavioral changes that continued for more than eight years after the program ended. So in this specific case, that means 
as part of the CTC process, communities decided to implement evidence-based interventions addressing um, young adolescents, but in theory, CTC could address um, students for a much longer time or much earlier as well. Yeah? So even though they just address them in this very small window, um, we see um, positive effects. So the durability of these effects is particularly noteworthy from my perspective because they perceive no additional intervention during high school or beyond. And that suggests that CTC successfully altered developmental trajectories during a critical period as the theory would inform us. So this timing also has important implications for prevention science, where we typically are interested in, in addressing uh, uh, children and uh, young adults. So what does it teach us for systems level change and potential developmental cascades? How can we create lasting change in community prevention systems? And can a focus on addiction prevention have a broader or have broader impacts on youth development in general? I would say that CTC's system approach offers some intriguing answers to these questions. A key strength is its focus on systems level change. Research shows that implement CTC implementation leads to increased community-wide adoption of science-based prevention practices compared to control communities, which of course also implemented some forms of interventions. This systems level impact appears to mediate CTC's effects on youth outcomes, as research shows. Furthermore, there's evidence of developmental cascade effects where CTC impacts outcomes not directly targeted by interventions, such as mental health. These findings align with the current perspectives in developmental science about the interconnected nature of various aspects of youth functioning as risk and protecti protective factor theory teaches us. So, Whilst I was focusing on a US study, um, which has its specific strengths given its longitudinal and randomized control design, there's a lot to, know, to learn from the cross-cultural uh, adaptation around the world. It has been implemented, to my knowledge, mostly in middle to high income countries. For example, Australia, the Netherlands, Germany, Sweden. And um, studies of these international implementations provide evidence that the CTC's effectiveness is given across diverse cultural contexts. And this cross-cultural uh, adaptability, adaptability, from my perspective, is a significant strength, demonstrating that the core components can be maintained while adapting to local contexts. These international studies also provide insights into which aspects of prevention may be universal and which may be more culturally specific. So what are the lessons for the field before I come to some open research questions and my conclusion? Given what we've learned about CTC, how, what are the implications for how we approach addiction prevention more broadly? How might the model inform policy decisions and future research directions in our field? I think CTC offers several important implications for addiction prevention science and policy. It demonstrates the effectiveness of a community-wide approach to prevention, also the cost effectiveness, which is very important for policymakers. It provides a model for translating prevention science into practice at scale. In Germany, for example, it is currently implemented in about 50 communities which, or, or municipalities, which is not so much given that we have 10,000, but it's a starting point. <laughs> the emphasis on implementation quality and local capacity building addresses key challenges in the field, I would say, because a lot of effort and also money is spent on ineffective prevention efforts, sadly. And the evidence of sustained long-term impact suggests potential for creating durable changes, not only in substance use trajectories, but also beyond. So before we conclude, let me highlight some key opportunities and challenges that lie ahead for us uh, in the field of community-based prevention. While the evidence base is robust, I would say, including the documented long-term effects which we just looked at through age 23 and strong cost-benefit ratios, several important research questions remain. One, for example, CTC is typically implemented in small to middle-sized communities. So the question is, can it be optimized for larger urban contexts or is there or, or will it have to remain at a small scale um, implementation? Current studies are examining how to optimize CTC for these different contexts. 
investigating its potential impacts on broader range of outcomes because there's obviously um, a need to address outcomes beyond substance use disorder or youth violence, for example. And it could be an opportunity to, to create it as kind of a platform to address all kinds of potential um, prevention outcomes that are of interest. And um, additionally, researchers are exploring how technology might enhance CTC implementation and evaluation, like, for example, creating more advanced monitoring tools, etc. So, to conclude, um, as we consider the conference theme of empowering the future workforce, <laughs> CTC offers valuable insights and tools, I would argue. It's not just an effective prevention system, it's a workforce development tool that builds sustainable prevention capacity in communities. Through its structured approach, it addresses key workforce challenges. How do we enable communities to make evidence-based decisions? How do we support quality implementation? And how do we build sustainable prevention infrastructure? I would say the evidence we've reviewed suggests CTC might be one model that may help build a more capable, confident, and effective prevention workforce by providing the structure, tools, and support needed uh, to implement evidence-based prevention effectively while building lasting community capacity. And on a personal note, at age 34, <laughs> I find it remarkable that despite being born in the same year that CTC was being developed in the United States, and despite its proven track record over three decades, including documented benefits of $12 return for every dollar invested, this evidence-based approach still comes as news to many prevention practitioners and policymakers. <laughs> what makes this especially surprising to me is how well CTC aligns with core health promotion principles. It embodies participation, empowerment, intersectoral collaboration while providing a structured framework for evidence-informed action. It demonstrates that we don't have to choose between community participation and scientific rigor. Rather, they can reinforce each other to create lasting change. My gratitude extends not only to you, <laughs> the audience, but also to the pioneering researchers, community leaders, and practitioners who have shown us that bridging science and community action produces sustained positive impacts that continue more than a decade after implementation. Their work demonstrates that we, when we combine systematic evidence with local expertise and meaningful community engagement, can effectively address challenges like youth substance use and mental health. The success of CTC across multiple countries and contexts gives us a tested roadmap, one that deserves wider recognition and implementation in our broader health promotion efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Max. We need to go fast. Now we have Ina Koning from the Freie Universiteit Amsterdam. Thanks. Um, board member of the USPR and essentially review board member of the exchange registry who had our meeting yesterday. Thank you so much. Um, this light is really annoying, um, so I can't see you, but it's good at all if you are here. Uh, I, I support all, everything that the previous two speakers uh, shared with you. And I would like to add, first of all, that there is no conflict of interest for me as well. Um, I would like to share with you another um, example of a case of an, a program or an approach that we uh, conducted in the Netherlands. It's a community-based environmental intervention. It's, I say, inspired by the Icelandic prevention model. Um, I think many of you know um, what that is. And just the strengths of this approach or of this model, it's a bottom-up approach, use of recent and local data with, with a quick turnaround of, of sharing this data with the municipality or with the uh, community itself. Uh, Multi-component, so across these four different domains that I just showed you, um, they target evidence-based mechanisms and promote also the positive behaviors, uh, which I think is good and it lowers the drinking opportunities. So having said that, this is what they show. Um, it's, it's, it's a great uh, approach. It's a fantastic model because in, this is what the numbers show us. Um, a decline in drinking, smoking, and uh, cannabis use over the years. However, so um, this is also what's been uh, shared in the media. 
at least in the Netherlands, and I know in many other countries, uh, this, there was this hype around the, the Icelandic prevention model. Um, so many countries are interested, and particularly politicians are interested in implementing this uh, program uh, because it will solve everything. That's what we just saw. Um, however, we do feel that there, is, there are some issues that need to be uh, taken into account when thinking about the implementation or adaptation of this uh, model, and we describe this in, um, in a position paper. You can, um, yeah, you can see the QR code here if you're interested. It's on the website of the USPR as well. And just briefly, these are the challenges that we feel are in the Icelandic prevention model. It um, does not really look at the transferability, so it's kind of just simply said copy-pastes everything they did in Iceland to the other uh, countries in the different contexts, which um, um, we know is not always uh, the right thing to do because there may be different uh, social contexts, which is the case. Iceland is a particular, a very specific country with specific characteristics. We describe these in more detail in the paper as well. Um, but it also highly depends on the alcohol policy that is um, in, in, implemented in the different countries and related to the implementation of intervention strategies. Um, there are challenges also with the data collection and storage. Um, they keep the data, they collect the data, they keep the data, and they own the data. Also, it's commercialized, so you need to pay them to um, collect the data. Well, that's not a bad thing in itself, because we do need to get paid for the work that we do. Um, but you have to show them exactly what you, are, um, what you are doing and what they pay for, and without any profit, actually. So also, what, what I think is, is, is most important also is that we do not have enough insight into the uh, link, so the um, uh, scientific link between the intervention strategies that they implemented and the, the changes that they show us. It's not clear how they have achieved these changes. So what did they do exactly and how did that change the behavioral outcomes in terms of substance use. So it has to do with the design, of course, um, but also uh, there is no logic model. So how these intervention strategies are connected to the different uh, determinants of behaviors that they aim to target. So taking all of these challenges into account, um, in this LEF program, this is what we did. Um, so we because uh, I'm in favor of the, the approach of the Iceland prevention model, which is in many ways similar also to the uh, communities that care uh, model that, that Max just uh, talked about. Um, we first did, conducted a needs assessment, um, an inventorization of stakeholders, so who should we be talking to, so to get an idea of what is going on in this particular context in this municipality. We did that by um, uh, interviewing them, so talking to all of these people. Um, and uh, conducting some self-reported questionnaires among youth. Based on that, we um, defined the desired outcome. So what is actu actually the, the thing that we want to change or to achieve? Um, based on that, uh, we identified determinants of behavior um, um, uh, uh, derived from uh, international knowledge and data, as well as the national, uh, the local data. Um, explanatory model intervention strategies, and um, we did that in co-creation. So what we did here is we developed our um, own monitor in this case, but it was based and connected to the national monitor studies. So this enables the um, uh, comparison to the national data. So then you also know better how this municipality is doing in comparison to the rest of the country. Um, but it also uh, indicates how relevant it is what you're doing. And I'll show you just an example. Um, and it allows tracking over time. This is the example. So on the left side, you see um, the prevalence of monthly drinkers across the different ages in the municipality where we implemented the intervention, Adam Volendam, in the Netherlands. And you see here on the left side that there's this huge jump from age 13 to 14 in the prevalence of drinkers. So this also shows us 
that if we want to prevent the onset of drinking, um, that we need to intervene before the age of um, 14. When we compare this to um, national data, back in 2018 when we started this study, uh, we see that, yes, in this municipality, overall, the pre prevalence rates of, of drinking is higher compared to uh, the average Dutch youth. So knowing this, where do we start then in, in uh, developing intervention strategies and also in, in, in co-creating that with them? So first of all, we wanted to create public support because it wasn't really supported to in implement any alcohol prevention strategies. Um, because most of the, the um, inhabitants thought that it's, it's a good thing and it's part of youth and you don't take away the youth, it's, it's just fun and why should we uh, prevent that? Um, so that was a big thing going on. So we had a lot of media attention in, um, at, at the local level. Um, so we did that on purpose to, to, to open up that discussion in the municipality, in the community. But we also needed to create support for the, uh, among the politicians, because they also are members of that same community, and they were also, not all of them were in favor of our work. And then, we described this in a paper more, um, uh, in more detail, but what are the biggest challenges is to, to keep on working in an evidence-based way, and at the same time, uh, take into account and take these, these um, community members who are involved to take them seriously. And they are enthusiastic and activity-oriented. But then we needed to wait because we first needed to develop the um, explanatory model. That's difficult. Also, politicians want to plan ahead. They want to know exactly how much money are you going to spend this year and next year and the year after. And we were not um, able to do that because it was depending on uh, the needs of the community at that time. And if the intervention strategies were not effective or uh, were not uh, feasible to implement, then we needed to adapt that again. So that, these are the biggest challenges that we encountered. Um, so we developed the explanatory model, also to have this foundation, um, because in a municipality, in all of the organizations, they like everything then. When, when something is going on, when something is moving, they all have these great ideas. But then we have to say, okay, but what is the thing that is needed and what can we do that is also um, evidence-based or evidence-informed? So that's why we developed the explanatory model, which you can see here, um, three different processes, and it um, all ends with the age of onset of alcohol use, which was the desired outcome. Based on that, we developed the um, uh, evidence-based or evidence-informed intervention uh, strategies. Uh, these were the first two after a year. Um, so we offered, based on the needs assessment, um, we found out that there was a lot going on in the municipality, but not um, so much for, a, a, not so many uh, different activities. So there were particularly sports activities that uh, were organized, but not every child likes sports. So that's something that we changed. Um, so more diverse set of activities, but also on the risky evenings. So on Friday evenings and Saturday evenings, these are the risky evenings um, when we uh, talk about substance use and alcohol use. Um, so we now offer also a more diverse set of activities, particularly in the, on these evenings. Secondly, we also started with the, and Gregor doesn't allow me actually to say this, um, but the enforcement of alcohol regulations in outlets. Um, so there wasn't any enforcement at all, because uh, the outlets were, could do whatever they want, and kids were in the outlets when they were uh, 12, 13, 14 years of age, and no one um, said anything about that. So that's also something that we changed. Um, and, of course, throughout this whole process, right from the beginning already, we had this monitor. We need to monitor everything. So we had, um, uh, now we have five different waves, two prior to the, intervent to the implementation of the intervention, um, and that was just a coincidence. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, 
as a, part of the, as a part of the needs assessment is one of them and the other one because there was so much time in between the needs assessment and the development of the explanatory model that we thought we needed an, an, an extra baseline assessment because many things could have happened in between. Okay, so in terms of monitoring, it's non-profit, so we collect the data and it's open access data, so everyone can use it. Also municipality and other organizations in the community can use it. Um, we used instruments that are also included in the national monitor study, so that to enable that comparison again. Um, and also what we did is the activation of local organizations. So in this case, it was uh, the university um, and, well, me, in pers me personally, um, but I think it's good to also see, okay, how, who can you activate in this context or in this specific country um, instead of um, the Icelandic people uh, that can do this work themselves. This is the first paper where we looked at these potential changes in, at, in the, at the first two waves, so before any intervention was implemented, so we, where we just conducted the, uh, the needs assessment and we developed the explanatory model and we increased or worked on the, the public support. Um, this is what, how it looks like. So we have this quasi-experimental design, so this one municipality that implements all of these activities that was in June um, 18, where we measured um, and, and conducted the needs assessments. We had the second wave of data collection in December 18, and in January 19, um, these diverse set of leisure activities and the enforcement of the alcohol regulations were implemented. And we have one control uh, condition, uh, more than 2,000 adolescents at the mean age of 14.7. So in this phase, um, I refer to it as a pre-intervention. Um, so we did co-creation and, and we had this media attention and these discussions going on. And I'll show you some results of that. And in the second phase, it was one of the uh, aims was to lower the, access, the uh, excess of alcohol in the outlets, in the premises. So, did we see any pre-intervention changes? Um, and as I said, this was really a coincidence. So I just checked at some point, okay, do I need to take into account both waves? Or is one, the, the last one in, in December is, is enough to look at, to take into, to use as a baseline assessment? Um, or how do, I, how do I do that? And what we saw is that um, I observed a higher level of weekly drinking among kids which was surprising, but a lower level of perceived access to alcohol in a formal setting. So we distinguished a formal and an informal setting. An informal setting is uh, drinking at home. So this kind of surprised me, um, and I <laughs> didn't know what to do. So what we um, also looked at is changes um, or differences between the different age groups. Because I noticed in these discussions that were going on that particularly the, the um, enforcement of the alcohol um, law in, in the um, formal setting, uh, that was a topic of discussion. Because what was going on, and these kids were no longer allowed to enter these establishments. And while they were, met, they were there already for many years, most of, most of them, so what we see is that only among the 14-year-old kids or younger, uh, they were the ones reporting a higher level of drinking. And we didn't do anything, actually. Um, so that was, that was kind of surprising for me. Um, and that, uh, what to do? Um, what we saw is the changes in the, in the mechanisms that the, the determinants of behavior that I showed you also in the explanatory model is that we saw that there were more stricter rules about alcohol, there were a development of less positive norms and a lower perceived access to alcohol also at home, but in this case, particularly um, among the 15-year-olds and older. So I find that really interesting. Um, one outcome that we also looked at, and this is not published yet, 
um, to look at the perceived accessibility of alcohol outside homes. So that's one of the intervention strategies, one of the things that we did, that we started with. Um, here you can see, uh, in January 19, we, we started doing that. And there you can see that the green line is the experimental condition. So where we implemented the intervention. And it kind of stays stable, the perceived accessibility of alcohol there. Well, while in the control group, it increases. It makes sense because these kids become older. So it makes sense that they perceive access to alcohol um, to a greater extent. So let's get back to the challenges that I uh, mentioned before that were I think well, that we identified in the Icelandic prevention model and that we hoped to tackle in the LEF program. Um, so I think it is key. I think it is really important to, to be aware of this transferability of interventions in other contexts and to take into account these, the cultural differences and the contextual differences and social differences. We have to do that. We just cannot copy-paste interventions. So conducting this needs assessment is always relevant. And then look at what is this, how, does, how can we develop this explanatory model and um, how do these different factors relate to one another. And I don't think that we need to do this process right all over from the beginning in every context because we do not need to forget what we already know because there is a lot out there as well but we have to check if that matches the needs of this particular um, community so i think we should take this into account um, and we had great discussions in the exchange board yesterday uh, with uh, fabrizio also like what would be the best design to um, evaluate these type of studies and then the interrupted time series um, it are, are a good design to do that. So I think that is also needed more to really say something about the effectiveness of these type of interventions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Ina. Fantastic. Now, who better could be the discussant than the second president in the USPR's history with a great record of framing, reintegrating things without a presentation. Exceptionally, Harry has even a presentation today. Thank you. We okay. take questions afterwards, obviously. Okay, thanks very much, Gregor. Uh, it's an honor to follow such fantastic presentations. So what I'm trying to do in, in, in my allotted time is to not focus on a specific project or model of delivery, but think about, well, how do we think about community-based prevention in a wider context? So Max referred to the social uh, environment, the social context. Uh, Samuel talked about the need to upscale these interventions. And so I'm gonna think about, extend that further to think about what are some of these wider issues, including political and policy determinants as well. But also reflect on advances in other fields as well, because I think sometimes we think and theorize around prevention in isolation without incorporating some of the advances in thinking in other areas. So hopefully I'll introduce that element as well. And first of all, what really struck me from Ina's presentation about the, the purported impact of the Planet Youth intervention in Iceland, while they've had this really focused intervention for many years, we're seeing that in other countries as well, with other behaviors, other types of behaviors. So if you look at the bottom left here, this is England and Wales, where I'm based, and we've also seen a substantial and significant decline in all forms of substance use over the last 30 years, without a prevention program, a national prevention program in place, without uh, uh, well-funded services and interventions, and without a functioning prevention system. So what else is happening? How are these outcomes being achieved in the absence of intervention? Uh, we do have some learning from the alcohol field, which I'll refer to at the moment, which can maybe explain some of that. This is, these are the, the important national context. And in contrast to that, all of you will be aware of some of the 
fantastic successes we've had at population level with regards to tobacco prevention. So uh, WHO Global tobacco prevalence estimates are all going in the right way, and they're largely attributable to focused policies and actions. But if we're thinking about this national context, what's driving these changes? But also, perhaps, how, do we, how will we, in future, set priorities at community level? It's really interesting to contrast global and national policies focusing on specific substances. If we have a look at what is the end game, what is an effective policy for these approaches? So if you look at the EU tobacco-free generation goal as part of the cancer strategy, uh, that's the aim there is a, a less than 5% global tobacco prevalence. The WHO has a target of a 30% relative reduction in tobacco use. So this would be described, that first indicator, as a tobacco-free world, even though prevalence is still around 5%. In contrast, if we look at the WHO Global Alcohol Action Plan, it doesn't set similar objectives. This is a policy, as many of you will be familiar with, and this is the same for many national alcohol policies, which seem to be socializing people into drinking. We had a fantastic presentation from French colleagues this morning, uh, where it was mentioned uh, focusing on the norms about moderate and responsible drinking. So a lot of policy, alcohol policy, is focused on establishing those boundaries to make us all into responsible adult drinkers where alcohol is permitted. So we need to think about this wider political environment as well. In contrast, when we look at illegal drugs, illicit drugs, UNODC ministerial declarations have, have they've changed slightly over the years. They've moved from a, a drug-free world to a society free of drug abuse. Looking at the EU drug strategy, the current strategy where the main objective is around the prevention of drug use. So very different policy and political environments in terms of what is the end game. So this is something else we need to take into account when thinking about community level actions. This is reflected in some of the broad policy actions. So many of you will be familiar with the WHO best buys. I'm using the example of alcohol again, but this also applies to tobacco as well. A focus on moderation of the market. So availability of substances, but restricting access, marketing, advertising, but freely available substances to a certain extent. And there's very little action here on specifically labeled prevention activities. Now, you'll see the immediate contrast with illegal drugs here where we don't have as many policy levers, and we're already in a very different policy environment, uh, where, in general, apart from those countries that have legalized uh, and provided a legally regulated cannabis market, for example, uh, that we have a very different policy environment. And so we have fewer levers, and fewer population-level levers, so we need to take that into account as well. And I've been really impressed by some work undertaken at the U University of Sheffield recently. Uh, and they've been trying to get, explain some of the reasons why alcohol use has continued to decline in mostly high-income countries, particularly in Western Europe and young people. This is a robust change. And they came to the conclusion that most of these changes have had very little to do with national policy action and are actually a result of broader social and cultural forces which are not amenable or readily amenable to well-designed prevention interventions. Now, there is an interaction here, but this is under-theorized. So we know, for example, that those WHO best buys, which are focusing on the regulatory environment and de decreased affordability, they will have an indirect impact on socialization practices, for example, at a local or community level. So there is an interaction there. And as people adjust their social behaviors, this will signal to policymakers uh, that populations are amenable to further restrictions. So it does work, but the fact remains is that most of these changes, we think, in young people have occurred in the absence of targeted prevention action. So how do we model this? How do we account for this in our community-based interventions? Can we do this? Now, there's been less work in the field of illicit drugs, control drugs, so uh, uh, this is something I'll be talking about in a session in a couple of days' time. Uh, but we've tried to theorize, in a similar way to some of that alcohol work, what are these broader social and cultural factors 
which were affecting illegal drug use. Uh, and we found a diverse range of factors from the individual, interpersonal, organizational, community, and policy and societal level in a classic socio-ecological model. But we also found that with respect to uh, illegal drugs in this case, national policy was also a determinant of harm. And it was also driving illegal drug use in some cases. And when we're thinking about community-based activities, community-based interventions, whether that's co-produced or we're thinking about a model such as CTC or the Icelandic model, these are external factors by which we have little control. And that remains a big challenge. And I was glad to hear that the, the summaries from colleagues about the, the specific barriers to effective action at community level. And I, I've been thinking as well in, about this. And there's a, there is an overlap here, I'll, I'm very pleased to say. It would have been embarrassing if my barriers were very different to theirs. But just in relation to some of my key points, in, in terms of barriers to effective action at community level, yes, we can talk about... Uh, funding constraints, the lack of trained personnel, and there's some fantastic European initiatives focusing on the prevention workforce, for example. But if we think about wider public health and social and health healthcare policy and practice, that has also moved on. That is also moving towards community level and place-based intervention. And many local authorities and local regions are placing a priority on these more generic and general public health approaches. So I think there's a risk in, in many countries that our labelled and specific prevention activity can, can sometimes become invisible. It's subsumed by that wider public health approach. I'm a public health researcher. I, I think that's a good thing. But we're also facing specific drug-related threats in many countries. So the importance in terms of policy advocacy is trying to understand how our community-based prevention interventions around drugs, alcohol, and tobacco, et cetera, fit within these broader developments which are addressing key social determinants of risk behaviors. Other barriers as well, and uh, one of our colleagues referred to this, but only very briefly, which, and I think this is really important, and it's, it's not accounted for in much of the literature, at least my reading of the community's literature. And this is around the issue of stigma and mistrust. So we heard from Samuel, Samuel's idealized model that community-based approaches should be community-led. That makes sense. But when you're in a policy environment where social norms are strictly against illegal drug use, for example, or against underage alcohol use, what happens for those young people and young adults who are transgressing those social norms? And the stigma involved in that leads to exclusion, poor practice, and poorer outcomes. So when we're thinking about community-based action, what are our specific stigma reduction activities? And I haven't heard very much about this from some of those well-studied and evidence models that colleagues were talking about. Uh, we've also heard about the challenges in evaluation and measurement. I, I don't think anybody has a, the idealized solution to this. But when we move to upscale some of these community-based activities, it does require new thinking and new methodologies, and we've not really grasped the challenges associated with this. And I'll, I'll return to that in a moment. Uh, other challenges as well, I'll only briefly go through these. Uh, I, I think there's a real issue around community fatigue and maintaining long-term environments. I can't remember which scientific philosopher it was who said that uh, the, the real determinant of progress in scientific thought is not evidence, it's that the older scientists die. That's a paraphrase. How do we maintain interest and advocacy for these types of approach? We weren't hearing, at least in Europe, about community-based approaches 10 years ago. Those of us on the periphery with a big interest in these topics were talking about this. But things change, fashions change. And Ina was talking about the media attention about the Planet Youth model. Uh, I, I have absolutely no doubt that in five years' time, all the focus will be on different types of models. So how do we maintain this community involvement and community ownership of these sorts of approaches? Something else that is, again, beyond our control, and I've alluded to this in the past, is there's changes in drug trends. 
We focused on tobacco for so long, but in many countries now, the issue is around vapes. I mentioned before that uh, drug use in the United Kingdom has been decreasing, uh, but now we have disproportionately high levels of drug-related harms associated with drugs like ketamine and the emergence of synthetic opioids. So how do we respond to these new challenges which are rapidly emerging and have a significant and acute public health impact? Are our models dynamic enough to respond to this? Acute threats as well as long-term prevention. Uh, something else which perhaps I don't have time to go into today, but quick advert, if you come to my talk on Friday about normalization, I'll talk about this in a bit more detail, about changing social and community dynamics, conceptualizations of drugs, and how the global world and global media is affecting that and affecting young people's response to drug use. Now, I spoke before about how do we incorporate uh, community-based approaches in other public health policies and practices. Many of you will be familiar with the WHO, WHO Healthy City model, although it often exists more in reports than in practice, although there's some fantastic examples around, around the world. And this is what I was talking about when I mentioned before that one of the challenges is, do we actually risk losing our specific prevention activity in these more generic social determinants models. Uh, these, these approaches often have appeal to policymakers and funders because they're not addressing specific risk behaviors, because they're addressing the common determinants of a range of health and social behaviors. Potentially, they're more cost effective. They potentially have greater population reach, but they don't address some of the specific concerns that we have around alcohol and tobacco. So there's always going to be a need to do that. But we need to think about why these models are implemented and also take on some learning, I think, as well. So arguing through the WHO Healthy City model that one of the strengths of this is this insistence on health in all policies. So as prevention advocates, we should also be arguing that there should be prevention in all policies. Whether that's hidden, whether that's directly labeled, what are the prevention opportunities for our locally delivered activities. How do we do this? Well, it's challenging, as we've heard from colleagues, particularly around the upscaling. Uh, that's true for any intervention, as you will all know, but particularly challenging for this, just in relation to all those different social contexts that I've mentioned. So one way of doing this is, again, to borrow from, borrow from the broader public health field, is to move away from prioritizing standalone interventions, although they might exist within a particular delivery model, and do as they've done in a wider public health activity to take this whole system perspective. And this does mean thinking about how responses to adolescent risk and vulnerability in health, including substance use, is normalized across diverse areas of related policy and practice, even for what we might consider unrelated practice, such as housing, and to a certain extent, education and youth development. But this also requires a change in mindset from researchers as well. Uh, Ina was talking about the challenges of evaluating the, the Planet Youth model, but I think we can take on some of the lessons and learnings from systems-based evaluations and research, where you don't focus on the impact of particular interventions, but you have a look at what's happening across the whole local system, the whole regional level, or even the whole national level. And you judge success here is not, not on the basis that intervention X leads to outcome Y, but how the system changes by introducing a new approach. And this also includes the importance of a range of primary and secondary outcomes. So not just focusing on substance use prevalence, which I think is a, a very uh, uh, broad and not particularly useful indicator, but looking at substantive outcomes of substance use, but also looking at structural changes as well. That is a challenge, but I think if we're going to properly evaluate and address some of the challenges that Samuel mentioned, we need to think about our evaluations in, in these way, this way as well. Okay, so that's my time up. Look forward to any discussion, and that's my contact details if you'd like to continue the conversation. So thank you.
Magnificent. Thank you very much. We still have time for questions and a debate. You will have to get up and go to one of the two microphones. I can't see anything because I'm basically blinded. So go, ask your questions if you can. I hope we have showed you that community-based prevention is something more than just an amorphous, unclear thing about where everyone is involved somehow in some kind, that there is a science behind, that we are looking at it, and that it's possible to implement even with scientific rigor without making too much false claims about it. Now, who has a comment and wants to raise her voice here? I have learned that I have to wait at least 30 seconds <laughs> and not to give up early. Please, want to tell us your name and... Um, yeah, sure. Uh, my name's Tara. Um, I'm a public health professional from Scotland. Um, uh, thank you for your um, presentations. I was really interested in this session because the challenges of community-based um, prevention um, are very real and live for me and a very political um, uh, problem in Scotland at the moment that, that we're wrestling with. I was really interested, Harry, in what you had said about um, the, um, I guess, the focus on, on social determinants and, and underlying determinants and that not leaving a place for um, community-based prevention. Um, and, and I thought that was very insightful and wondered if you could say a bit more. And the other question that I had was about children's rights and the, the UN Convention on Children's Rights. And do any of you see that as having a, a place within community-based uh, prevention? So is it a form of promoting children's rights um, was my question. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, great couple of questions. If I could just, I'll just briefly respond to the one about social determinants. Uh, and th th this is not, this, my perspective on this is we shouldn't be doing this. Of course we should be doing that. But I think it relates to what we know about the, the development of drug use, alcohol use that it does seem plausible and intuitive that there are important social determinants of this, and epidemiological studies support this. But where the evidence is lacking is around policies and programs which address those key social determinants having an impact on, on uh, these sorts of risk behaviors. There's still an absence of evidence there. Uh, and I think because uh, the social determinants approach is so embedded within public health practice, and rightly so. If you talk to any director of public health in the United Kingdom, they'll focus on this, and strategies are based on this. I do think there's the risk that we avoid funding or prioritizing specific prevention programs, which we know can have potentially specific effects on some of the behaviors that we've spoken about that somehow it's washed out in this wider social determinants approach when we know we're facing very real and specific risks around substance use and they're associated with particular outcomes as well. So it's not a case of one or the other, but ensuring that our labeled prevention programs are a part of and aligned with these broader uh, primordial approaches. On the question of uh, the implementation of the UN Convention on the, of the Children's Rights, I can only speak for the example of Germany, and Germany, of course, is a very diverse country in terms of federal states and so on, and their own um, strategies for implementation, but I think it addresses a typical issue in community-based prevention, the fact that this is kind of established as a new additional structure, the way how you know, such a new idea or convention comes into the system is that it, it is another parallel structure that somehow interacts with existing structures, but there's rarely a really unified, efficient approach that integrates 
what already exists and um, this is one of the main challenges I observe on the community level is that uh, there's a lot of money in the system, there's a lot of people responsible, but there's a lack of integration, communication and an, uh, a shared understanding of what is important. And this is kind of uh, what can be observed, even though I, I must acknowledge that um, very important progress has been made as a result of the implementation of the UN Convention of the Children's Rights. So, one more question, at least. Not even Jana. You have always a question. <laughs> Not today. Okay. <laughs> I think what Harry said is important because when you culturally, when we talk, many Americans say when you talk about prevention, they mention programs. The so called I frame. Let's make people more. Resilient, as I said, focused on the individual behavior. So it was a really nice development that now Nora Volko from NIDA make a public post on, on, her, on her blog talking about the commercial determinants of health. That it's not about, not sufficient to do programs in order to make individuals more resilient, but to tackle the commercial determinants of health as well. And this has to do with regulatory policies and, and larger and policies at a larger stage. So you see there is a lot of work to do on the narratives about prevention. Prevention is not only developmental. We need to tackle broader determinants and therefore the community-based prevention in a very, in a well-done professional and scientific way is, is an important step forward with all the limitations we have here. I think then we conclude if there are no more comments. Otherwise, No, I was just going to comment on that, Gregor, in terms of how the prevention field is rapidly changing and particularly in relation to what's happening internationally with changes to cannabis legislation. Uh, I don't know the answers, but how, how do these community-based approaches, how do they fit contextually with these wider regulatory changes which are making potentially harmful drugs available? That, that's not a comment for or against uh, legalization or regulation, but just in terms of a prevention perspective, how do we address those challenges, do you think? Well, we are not really. The point is because we are particularly bad in the narratives, we allow people to say, yeah, we make a lousy regulation and prevention will fix it. Implicitly saying prevention is providing information. We will make more information campaigns. This is what well-known people in well-known countries in this continent are saying. So the narrative is not let's make a very good prevention system that responds actually to the potentials and challenges of legalization. No, that step has not been done. There was also no consultation with prevention societies about that. That's the, the work we still have to do, also in order to dominate that narrative a little bit better. Now, one minute left, no more questions. I think we can close now. Thank you very much. It was great contributions, great public. Thank you.